Hey, good evening, everyone. My name is Salvatore Seely. I am Health and Wellness Program Director at Camp Rehoboth. I'm so excited to bring you the second in a three-part series of our haunted history with Dr. Carol Polio during the month of October. Next week, we'll be live from the Marvel Museum in Georgetown at 7 p.m. We'll be streaming from our Facebook page at Camp Rehoboth. So take a look, Facebook, Camp Rehoboth, and we'll be Facebooking live 7 p.m. next week. Before we start, I just wanted to go over a couple of technical details. The workshop is being held on location, so there might be some technical issues. If something happens that may or may not be supernatural, please have patience with us. There's a question and answer box on your lower right-hand screen. At the end of the presentation, or if you feel moved during the presentation, feel free to uh, type in some questions that you have for Dr. Carroll. We'll get to them if we have time at the end of this evening. So let's get going. We're excited to bring our haunted history live from the Brick Hotel in Georgetown, Delaware. Thank you to the innkeepers and to the owners for letting us be here tonight and for allowing us to share the story of the hotel here in Georgetown, Delaware, live with our audience. You're in for a treat this evening with Dr. Carroll. Uh, Dr. Carroll is founder of Intuitive Investigations, and currently she is director and lead investigator. She realized her abilities as a clairvoyant as a preteen. As often the case, she struggled with the influx of psychic information from those around her and the spirit world ultimately deciding to push those abilities aside to pursue a career in science. Despite her efforts to downplay her abilities, visions, and premonitions, they continued to make their way into her life. Over the years, those experiences prompted her to begin investigating the paranormal and tapping into her clairvoyant, clairvoyance by providing insightful personal readings for family and friends. This is our third year of working with Dr. Carroll, and we're so glad that all of you could join us tonight as we, prevent, as we present our haunted histories live from the Brick Hotel in Georgetown, Delaware. Dr. Carroll, thank you for, uh, for being with us this evening. Well, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. This is a really unique location, um, and this is obviously a unique format that we have tried last week, which was awesome, and it went really well. So we're going to repeat this today and then again next week. So we're here at the Brick Hotel. And just a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how I investigate in case you've missed it in the past so you know kind of what I do and why I do it. About the location. So we're going to kind of dive a little bit into the history of the Brick Hotel. And then I'm going to present just a few of the findings, some of the data that we have collected on our investigations here. So let's get started. Um, the first is a little bit about equipment. Um, I brought some of the basic equipment with me. The most important thing that I use is a recording device. And um, today everyone has one. Everyone has them in their phone. Um, but I use that. And I get a lot of really good evidence that way. I also use typically um, a K2 meter, which is a meter that um, reads electromagnetic frequency. So I have that here with me. So if I see that go off, I'll certainly let people know. Um, I also work a lot with historic spirits. And frankly, that's my favorite thing to do is to go to historic sites. Um, I really like the energy at those locations. And it's fun to learn more about our ancestors You'll notice that I have not and typically don't use the term ghosts because I feel like that's honestly a little disrespectful because these are our ancestors. These are our people that we are talking about and talking to. So these um, figures from the past, our predecessors, um, are pretty comfortable going back and forth and talking with us. I use a, a pendulum and I have it here with me um, to ask questions, record answers. Um, one of the things that they seem to like, also historic figures, is dowsing rods. Now, so we use those as well. Um, I kind of leave it up to spirit what they want to use. Some prefer the dowsing rods because they recognize them right away. 
Um, a lot of the new equipment, sometimes it's a challenge because the spirits do not understand new technology. So sometimes that's a challenge. So using some basic things often works better in this situation, but I just wanted to share a little bit about that. So the meter that I showed you picks up electromagnetic frequency, meaning what we believe to be spirit presence. So it lights up when there's energy near that device. And I have a few more other items over here I won't show you, but we're just kind of keeping an eye on what's going on with those. And so that's what would happen. You might hear or see a response to spirit. Typically when I come here in some of these other locations, I bring my students. I teach a paranormal investigation through Delaware Tech. And so I will bring students to do investigation as part of that class. And I've done some public investigations. Uh, I did a really large one with the um, Lewis Historic, Historical Society. Um, but primarily with students is how I go to these sites or on my own to just learn more about it so I can share it with you. Um, so let's get into a little bit about the history of the Brick Hotel. So we are here in Georgetown. The Brick Hotel um, is named uh, because back when it was built, 1836, there wasn't much clay available in this part of the state. So there were very few brick buildings. In fact, during this time period when it was built, up until 1900, there were less than a dozen brick structures because there was no local clay available or very little. So they found a, um, a clay pan nearby, just outside of Georgetown, and so they were able to use that to build this building. So most structures were wooden at that time, therefore this was the Brick Hotel. And that was the name of it for much of its history, but not all of it. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, <clears throat> in 1837, so just a year after it was built, they decided to build the courthouse. They tore down an old wooden courthouse and built a new one out of brick. But during the next year or two, they held court here. And at that time in history, the judges actually traveled to the different courts. So there weren't any judge, judges permanently here. They would go to wherever, whichever courtroom and hold court there. So court was held here for about two years. In uh, 1841, 1844, I'm not a historian, so I have to sneak a peek at my notes. If you know. <laughs> Excuse me for that. The post office was housed in here as well. So this was really a gathering place. We all, many of us know about the circle and how, you know, a lot of things were built around the circle and everyone would come here as the county seat and all, but every, all the functions were here just as they are today. So we're in this room. This is room number three in Tinker Hall. And why is it called Tinker Hall and why are we in room three? Well, I'm not sure, not sure if everyone knows what a tinker actually is. Um, between the time period of roughly 1850 to 1908, I'm just going to give a window for it. Um, tinkers were typically tinsmiths. So they were tinsmiths. That's when tin became more common here, available in the US. And the tinsmith or tinker, as they were called, were traveling. They were salesmen. They would sell tin utensils, like kitchen utensils and plates and that sort of thing. But they also repaired things. So they would also bring with them a cart full of parts. So I was reading an article. It was kind of interesting. It was a teapot porcelain teapot that had broken and a tinker had formed a new handle, a, a handle for it out of metal. So you have a porcelain teapot with a metal handle. That's the kind of repair because that people would do because people didn't throw things away then. So a tinker would come to town and sell some of those, the tinware. Um, he would also repair it. So that is why this is called Tinker Hall. However, we also have a tinker here who goes by the name of George. 
as in spirit. So George, this is the room that we talked to George in, um, in the attic room. So that's what tinkers were. They were uh, traveling repair and tinsmith people that just traveled around doing that. And we were in a building last time, we talked a little bit about the attic rooms and in some places the basements was where the workers would stay. So George is up here because this used to be the attic and that is where the working class would stay in a hotel like this. Remember, attics were not particularly pleasant places. They were extremely hot um, in the summer and extremely cold in the winter. So this is kind of the working man's part of the hotel. So I said earlier that the brick wasn't always called the brick. The one time that it changed its name was during the Civil War. So during the Civil War, 1861, 1865, the country was divided. And so too was of Sussex County. During that time, this became the Union Hotel. So you can see where this is going. Okay, so the Union Hotel is what it was called. Um, across the circle was another hotel. It was a wooden hotel made of wood um, called the Eagle Hotel. And that's where the Southern sympathizers would stay. So both sides would have a good evening of hanging at the bar, get kind of liquored up, and then they would go out into the circle and argue which often turn to fist fights. So that's another bit of folklore for Georgetown. During the Civil War was literal fights that would happen out in the middle of the circle about the war itself. So on to 1910. In 1910, um, something that was also common, um, John Truitt, who owned, owned the hotel at that time, his wife was out making a lard in the backyard. So that requires a big fire and a big, um, you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> big pot to make the lard in the back. And she was very badly burned. She got too close to the um, flames and her dress caught on fire. And that's actually very common. In fact, that happened in the uh, Cannonball House as well, tending to the fire and your long skirts we don't think about today would catch fire. So she was okay. It said no serious result. But just to give you a glimpse of what life might have been like back then, that was 1910. Well, in 1919, um, the owner, John Truitt, uh, is 63 years old. He is in the parlor um, sitting there. He starts gasping for, for breath. He falls over. Um, they even had a doctor sitting at the table with him, tried to assist him. He did not make it. So the owner in um, 1919 dies of heart troubles. Um, he also, uh, John Truitt, before he had come and owned this hotel, he used to manage the Eagle Hotel. So just went from one hotel across the circle to this one. Interestingly, his brother, a few months before that, of heart trouble as well while staying here in the hotel. So, but with a few months of each other, the owner and the brother both passed away in this hotel. Um, we don't know that we communicated with um, John Truitt, but we do know when we asked about him that someone in this group that I'll talk to you a little bit about in a minute of three men, one of them responded through it. So someone recognized the, the name, the local name. Um, in the 1930s, we, we had some um, responses when we were uh, investigating that there was a man called James Joseph and he lived here when it was a boarding house. So it was not only a hotel, it was the post office. It had, we had court here. It also ended up being a bank for a while but he was staying here when it was a boarding house in the 30s. And he used to tell stories and he loved to do that. So he would go down into the parlor and sit and tell stories down there. Um, and we had a long conversation with him when we investigated and two other men that were with him. One of them being a, a barkeep. So definitely some interesting um, things going on in the 30s here. In 1955, the building was sold 
to the Wilmington Trust Company, and that's when this building became a bank. So from 1955 to 2008, this was a bank building. There is still a large vault downstairs. Um, I know they had the wine room in there, so you could rent the vault as a wine room. I'm not sure if they're still doing that, but you can check with the counting house and see if they still do that. So originally this building had 17 fireplaces. So that's just, that kind of blew my mind. There are still the original eight on the upper floors. So the downstairs was the one that was altered the most. Um, and then in 2008, 2009, the state of Delaware um, bought the hotel from the bank and they were going to tear it down to build some kind of other structure. And that is when a uh, local group was formed, Save the Brick, and through their, their help, dissuaded <laughs> the state from doing what they were going to do. And eventually that paved the way for Lynn and Ron Lester, the current owners, to purchase the building and restore it back to its original purpose as a hotel, which they have done. So it's beautiful, that's the history. Um, I think I missed one person in here somewhere. Ah, yes, in 1941. It's the 1930s. Told you about the storyteller. I'm sorry, I have this is an important one. In 1941, the owner, Henry Oakley Mott, he was 67. He was reading in the parlor and he um, fell to the floor and had a hemorrhage, brain hemorrhage. So he actually passed as well. So that's two owners and the brother's owner that we know of that have passed here. And um, his wife, we may have had a conversation with his wife. His wife's name was Catherine Mott. So that's the history. A little bit about that. So um, let's talk a little bit about the findings. And I'm going to share with you um, my screen. Um, I need the screen sharing allowed. You're all set, Dr. Carroll. Thank you. <laughs> it happens. All right, so let's find that. Getting the sound and everything ready for you guys. All right. Okay, so let's look at some of the data that I've gathered here. Um, I've been here uh, twice up here, and I've also investigated in the Counting House restaurant as well. So this will cover both locations. Um, we're going to talk about the woman in white. So there is a woman in white. I have my own personal theory about that. I've heard it so many times. And what I believe, it was a full body apparition on the staircase. Multiple people have seen her walking down the stairs. She is in room four, typically, but they have seen her walking down the stairs. Room four is right next to us up here. Um, my theory on women in white, and the reason so many people see women in white, is because I think we're seeing them in black and white. And so therefore, any color that isn't black is white or gray. Um, and I think that's true, and it may be because of energy. They need so much energy to produce that. Or maybe it's just we're looking at a different dimension or looking, some people call it through a veil. I don't know, but I think that's what the story is about. I think they're in white because they're not gonna, you're not going to see yellow or green or whatever other color. So a full body apparition that's been seen on the staircase several times. George the Tinker, who's here with us. When I first investigated, they thought George was downstairs causing trouble in the kitchen, but George stays up here. He stays up here because that's where a working class person would be. They wouldn't be down in the kitchen. Um, there was a five-year-old boy that we heard about from the woman in white. Um, in the dining room, there's a Mrs. M. I hope she's Mrs. Mott, but she does talk about that she served people. Um, and we have quite a few uh, interactions with a woman in the dining room that kind of 
maybe her, things like saying she liked people when people visited, she liked serving people. Um, James Joseph and the two other males that are in the bar. There may be a second female in the dining room. The male in charge of the kitchen. Now the kitchen is an interesting place and if you've ever worked in food services, you know sometimes that the chef is challenging. So we have a challenging person in charge of the kitchen um, who shows his anger apparently. And then we did get uh, Roseanne, someone named Roseanne in the back dining room. So we don't know, again, if she's modern or if she's someone um, from history, but we did, we did hear her tell us her name. So, so this is, we're in the bar area. And this is a female that we did not identify. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to hear this. So it's a class A EVP, which means Electronic voice phenomena, if you're listening to a recording and you can hear what they're saying without even having to make it louder, that's considered class A. There's class A, B, C, and D. Um, a, you can hear right away. B, you need to bump it up. You need to manipulate a little bit to hear it. C, you really can't make it out. I guess it's A, B, C. Um, and then the D, you know, is, the, is controversial because some people believe, you know, it's like a, um, if you're old enough and you you know, put the record on and you move it backwards, you hear things. There are some people that believe if you play the recording backwards that you can hear things as well, but that's very controversial. So we asked, um, do you like it when people come and stay here? And if you can't hear these, um, you know, on intuitive investigations, I have a YouTube page. So you could go there and you could put headphones on and you could listen because um, these are we're not going to hear it with the fire siren going in the background. We'll try. But if you can't, they're meant to be heard with headphones. So I tried to bring you the best ones that I had. So here we go. Do you like it when people come and stay here? Do you like it when people come and stay here? Do you like it when people come and stay here? So it's a female voice, it's whispery, and it doesn't help when you have a fire. So um, do you like it when people come and stay here? Yes. Um, certainly the owners were very happy to hear that. No one likes to hear a spirit say, no, I don't like people being here when you're trying to, to run a business. You hear it? Good. All right. So here we are in the bar. And again, remember there were three males in the bar. One of them was James Joseph. We don't know who the second one was. Um, it could have been John Truitt. We don't really know. But it's kind of interesting that um, this young barkeep, he said he was around 18 years old. He's got an Irish accent, which is interesting. And if you've never heard of a gimlet, it is a drink made with gin and lime. It was developed by the Navy in the late 1800s. And the reason they developed it is because sailors were getting scurvy. And so if you want sailors to drink something, what do you add to it? You add alcohol to it. So once they made the gimlet, his name, the Navy commander was the gimlet. Once they made the gimlet, then sailors didn't get scurvy anymore. They got drunk, but they didn't get scurvy. And that was important. So at that time, we, I think this is the 1930s. And the reason is because it wasn't until the late 20s that that drink really became more common in the US. So this is all it says on it is the gimlet. We are just talking to the barkeep. You hear that, that little, little bit of an Irish brogue in there? It's the gimlet. All right. So this is also there, the uh, kitchen. Now in the kitchen, they had problems here, okay? They had a knife that was thrown in the kitchen. Um, they had um, some dishes that were pushed off of the shelf, a large bowl. They were um, making, I think, wings or something in a large bowl and the bowl flew off the counter. So what we were trying to do in investigating the kitchen was to find out who was doing that, if we could. 
and to ask them to stop doing that because obviously no one wants a knife thrown at them while you're trying to work, okay? So this person that was in the kitchen gave us the impression that he was in charge. We don't know, it could have been Henry Mott. He answered that it was him, but again, one data point. So usually we try to get more than one answer. The kitchen was very noisy, even though no one was there. So it was hard to capture a lot but we did get this. So this is why are you throwing the knife, knives in the kitchen? Why do you throw a knife? I'm choking. So he says, why did you throw a knife? And he says, they're shirking. Did you catch that? Why do you throw a knife? I'm choking. Why do you throw a knife? I'm choking. So what's shirking? Shirking is an old term, and I know about it from being in the military, for not doing their job. They're shirking, they're not working hard enough. So we asked this kitchen person, <laughs> chef, uh, he just said he was in charge of the kitchen, um, if, he could, if he could stand not to do that anymore. Like it was okay that he was there, but please don't throw knives anymore. And he agreed not to do that. So hopefully they're not having any more incidences of that nature. Pushing things around, not as big a deal, but throwing things at people is a problem, right? So this is an interesting one for you. This is photographic evidence. So when we were investigating this, this time, we were up in the front dining room and having a, in a conversation, and the two women are seated at um, they're seated at a chair here, and they're having a conversation with a pendulum and a spirit box, and they're talking. And I came back into the room, and I was just compelled. I just had to take a picture right away. Now, I mentioned last time I use an uh, instant camera, instant film camera, because old school works best. I've gotten great pictures that way. I have not with a traditional camera, but with these I do. So if you look at this picture uh, in the upper right corner, there's this white fuzzy thing there, okay? It's like got three parts to it, like it could even be a head and shoulders, I'm not quite sure. Um, but it was during a time when they were actively talking, so that's partially evidence. Um, the fact that I came in and I felt like I had to do it, to me, that meant something since I do have abilities and I said, something's going on here. We took about 20 more pictures from every angle, did everything that we could, waited for cars to come by. No other pictures show anything like this. It's not a reflection. We couldn't even make a reflection off the floor when we tried. So we think it's evidence. It's very good evidence because of the situation. And we hope uh, that Mrs. M is actually Mrs. Catherine Mott. Um, but that's the picture that we got, which I think is, to me, is, is pretty uh, compelling. So there it is, much larger. And you can just see it's, it's a mist. It's not, um, it's not a reflection, and we could not reproduce it. And that's what you try to do. You also always try to take at least three pictures in a row, which I did, and this is the only one that had that on it. So good stuff, stuff we like to see. All right, so this one is just a little fun for me. This is, um, looks a lot like this room. It's one of the rooms up here on the, the top floor. And it's a, it's sounds like a woman or women answer. We're asking them to talk to us. And then there's a male that responds after that. So you're going to hear that they're trying to speak and what his response is. So we're saying, what is your name? And they say, women say, we're trying. And then a male voice says, shut up. Hey. It happens. It happens uh, a lot in investigations where some of the spirit that there doesn't want to talk or think something is going to happen, bad is going to happen if they, if they answer up and say they're here. So 
You get sometimes that, don't talk to them, be quiet, shut up. So I thought it's kind of a fun one. It's like, we're trying, no, shut up. <laughs> so, all right, so this one is one you should be able to hear without any problem at all. This is the woman in white. They used to call her Ophelia. I won't say that word again. She doesn't like it when you use that because it's not her name. And the reason I know that, this is pretty interesting. Um, she's in the room next door, Tinker Hall. This is the woman in white that they've seen go down the stairs, um, downstairs. And she told us that she was here because she was married here. And it was the happiest day because all of her family was here. And so that's why she's here. The way we got this recording is really interesting to me as an investigator because we were recording what we were doing. We were sitting in the room recording the session. And one of my students decided to take a video on her phone of us investigating. And that video was just a few seconds long, you know, maybe 15, 20 seconds, maybe 30 seconds long of us. So we're all sitting there. I did not know, none of us knew she was recording us. When she started to turn off her phone, that, that recording started playing over and over again. So we heard this, and I want you to hear it, and you will definitely hear it. I'm frustrated. I'm like, would you please tell us your name? Because we've been asking and asking, and Ophelia wasn't going to cut it. So this one's pretty clear. This was imprinted on the video. All right. I hope you took a moment to tell us your name. I hope you took a moment to tell us your name. Bernadette, very clearly telling us her name. <laughs> So now it's no longer that name, it's Bernadette and George, who's up here. So those are the, um, the evidence that I have. Sal? So if anyone has any questions at this time, if you want to put them in the chat box, we have a few minutes uh, for questions. So we, we do have one question from our Facebook feed. Do you do private readings uh, virtually? Um, I, the kind of readings that I do are focused on this kind of work. If someone has issues with spirit or um, like in their home or something like that, I generally don't do mediumship readings. I do psychic readings. Occasionally people come through, but that's not really what my focus is. I'm not focused on mediumship readings. I'm focused more on this kind of uh, work. So I do readings, I do psychic readings, but um, I don't promise to do mediumship because I really am focused on this historical aspect and helping people that have potentially a problem with spirit versus um, talking to grandmas or <laughs> people that have passed on. So that's not my focus. Uh, another question, have you ever investigated the Stanley Hotel? No, <laughs> I have not. I don't know. Is that a Pennsylvania Stanley Hotel? I don't know where that is, but I have not, no. All right. Uh, we do have another question from our Facebook feed. In any of your investigations, have you ever felt fearful of your life? No, I have not. Um, the only time that I've ever been uh, afraid was when I had my first series of uh, experiences when I was 20 and I didn't understand what was happening. Um, but I have not. Um, I've had this, my own group here for uh, five years now and I've spent a number of years, more than that, probably six or seven at least, on the Maryland Paranormal Research group and in all of their events um, that I've been to in investigations, we've only had one case, I was not on that case, but only one case where there was something um, really negative there, um, but still not anything that anyone was afraid of, so no. 
Another question from our Facebook feed. In Sussex County, what location have you been to that has the most paranormal activity? Hmm. Um, I think the most is probably the Cannonball House. Uh, that would probably be the one that has the most, as far as being able to get a lot of responses there, it has been. Um, I do like, we'll be at the Marvel Museum. I like the Marvel Museum because it has uh, so many buildings and the Lewis Historical Society is the same way. There are so many buildings. Um, also on the Lewis campus, the Burton Ingram house is pretty interesting spirit wise. So I think those are probably the busiest ones. Another question, we get a lot of, we have a lot of Facebookers tonight, Dr. <laughs> Good. Um, what is your most memorable investigation in Delaware? Something that uh, inspired you or you had a moment of awe? Hmm. Well, um, I will say that uh, the interactivity here uh, with Bernadette, um, when you get something like that that's so clear, that you hear in the you know in the moment as that started recording and people have for years called her something else that was to me that was a really cool moment um that's one of the best that for me but uh there are a lot of really good locations in sussex county um so it's, it's sometimes it's hard to pick one but, can you talk more about your students? What do you teach them? And then what profession or how do they plan to use their training? Okay, the students uh, that I teach are in the uh, personal enrichment program. So they're not getting credit for the courses. Um, so uh, it's not applying to a degree or anything. Uh, it is teaching them how to do a scientific and proper and ethical investigation so that people learn the right way. And that's why I do it. I teach it because I want people to learn how to do this in a respectful way. Well, the more people that do it that way, the more places will be able to investigate. And the people that don't do it that way, the doors close on us and we can't investigate. So it's, it's that, it's um, typically given once a year um, in the fall, this year is a little different, as always, uh, everyone knows, um, and I'll be teaching for them in the spring online, giving the course, but Great. Yeah. So we have um, a, a Zoom question, two questions. How, do, how does the pendulum and dowsing rods work? And then the other question is, was the woman in white an actual photo of her in your PowerPoint? <laughs> it's not an actual picture of her. Um, it is from that same time period that she said that she was from. Um, I wish I had a picture of her, but I don't. Um, and the first part was, oh, the pendulum yep. and, the, and the dowsing rods. The way that we use them is um, we always give instruction so that there's no question about what response we're getting. And you can basically use them for yes and no answers for the most part, questions. That's about the most that you can do. But, um, and that's why being, well, we're, we're recording at the same time because a lot of times we'll get answers actually on the recording device. So we'll get voices on the recording device, but while we're live in the moment, we're getting yes and no answers. So we give instructions. And the instructions are, I've got the pendulum here, you know, we, we give directionality and say if you're going to say yes to a question, you go this direction. If you're going to say no, you go the other direction. And you have to be very clear because you don't want to be getting all wrong answers. The other thing about using these, um, these devices is that one answer is not good enough. If you're doing a scientific approach, you're going to circle back and you're going to ask different ways. You're going to spend 
uh, some time on using different pieces of equipment that give you some real-time voices. You're going to change your equipment. So you might spend an hour in this room, but you're going to do several different things using different equipment and, and methods so that you can get multiple times that someone says, yes, this is, they probably get sick of hearing it. Yes, this is Mr. Mott already. <laughs> you know, you told, I told you that. Um, but that's why. So it's not, even though it seems like, oh, well, you know, if you move the, if you move the dowsing rods out to the side, it means yes. If you cross them, it means no, right? So if that happened once, that's not enough evidence to say that's actually true because there are lots of reasons, including your own motion of your, um, your muscles and, and your body um, for those things to happen. So you have to get multiple. So you try to get more than just this. So that's why I said we say, think it's um, maybe Mr. Truett, but we don't know for sure because we got a yes to a Mr. Truett, but the next time we didn't get an answer or we didn't get, we got someone else saying Truett. We don't know if he said Truett or someone else did because we don't know how, who all is, is around and who's responding. So that's how you do it. You give instructions. But then you also try to back it up with what you get on the recording, what you get on a spirit box device, what you get, I have an Ovilus device. I mean, there's multiple different ways to um, help spirit talk to us. And these are just the simplest ones um, that you can at least get some information and narrow down what you're asking. So does that make sense? And I think this is a follow-up question. Okay. Um, there are actually two good follow-up questions. The first one is from Zoom. Do you try to confirm an answer, not necessarily by asking again, but by commenting, as in saying, hi, Bernadette, how are you, or something like that to see if she responds? Uh, yes, actually, it's interesting because uh, others have found this too. There's a, a woman who did a whole lot of studies in uh, South, I think she's in South America. And when you're having conversations with each other even, um, that's when a lot of the EVPs happen. So if I were talking to you, Sal, about what's going on, um, we'll be corrected or we'll have someone stepping in to become part of the conversation. But yes, we do. We do that. That's actually what we do when we're using a pendulum. We're asking the yes and no, and then every few questions, we'll just throw in a question that isn't a yes or no for exactly that reason, to give opportunities to answer questions. And we just stay silent and we give some time. And we get some pretty interesting uh, responses. So this isn't a question, <laughs> just a comment that you don't necessarily need to read if you don't want to, oh, to me, but I think it's really interesting. I completely believe in this and I call them spirits. I hope that's not offensive. I did just hear you use the term. When we first bought our 1913 house in DC back in 2001, in the same weekend separately, but within 24 hours of each other, my partner and I experienced the same thing when we fell asleep on the couch in the living room. We were both paralyzed and both heard children playing. In my case, I heard them ask for pudding. Neither of us told each other but our, about our experience beforehand. Neat. <laughs> yes. Um, I, my first experience when I was 20 was very similar to that. Um, so, and the first part, I, I call them spirits or people. Um, I just don't like the, the ghost word because I just don't think that's the right word, but spirit, I use spirit all the time, use the word spirit, so yes. Um, when, I was, when I was 20, um, the, the funny part about that is that um, I kept waking up the guy that I was seeing to hear the banging that was going on in the room. It happened two nights in a row, several times in a row, um, and I didn't talk to him for years and years, and 15 years later, um, we got in touch, and the first thing he asked me, he said, that didn't happen, right? <laughs> I said, of course, you know it happened, because you were there. So he had started talking himself out of that experience, but he was there and heard the same thing that I did, and it was we were falling asleep, and the banging started, and then I wasn't asleep anymore. 
was awake. Um, and the next night, falling asleep, the same thing happened, and the banging started right in the room. So, yes. Can you sense a presence at the same time you are investigating and recording? Yes. I, it's something that I did not know I could do. Um, my background was uh, clairvoyance, psychic ability. Uh, but in doing investigations, particularly when I started and I was being uh, trained in the Maryland group, by going to all these different historic sites with them, um, I learned what that felt like. So I had the data from the, the evening, what we got, knowing that there was spirit there, and I could compare it and I could start kind of honing in on what that felt like. So that's something I developed a sensitivity to. I think a lot of us are. I probably was sensitive to it. That's what someone asked me. Why didn't, you know, I asked myself even, why didn't I ever have a, a haunted house? And it's because <laughs> I'm pretty sure I walked into it and said, no, no, I don't think so. But I did not connect how that felt with that until I started investigating. And now I walk into a room and I can feel a presence. And typically I can tell it's male, female, you know, I can get kind of a sense of what it is. But I learned to do that based on what I was, um, what I was there for and knowing if there was something there, I started to kind of tease out what that felt like for me. Uh, I think we just have one more question. Have you ever been to the Civil War Museum in Gordonsville, Virginia? No, I have not been there. Sorry. I've been a lot of places in Virginia. If you want to go to a haunted place in Virginia, the Bell Grove Plantation is definitely a place you want to go. The, wor the worst spirit I know of so far is there, contained in a building. And where what part of Virginia is that in? The eastern. There are two Bell Grove Plantations. It's the eastern part of the state. So it's not too far from us, a couple hours, three hours maybe. Um, but he, he is a really awful person. And I think that's, someone asked earlier about negative uh, spirits and was I ever afraid for my life? The answer is no. But the other part of that answer is that, you know, if you were like, a, I say this all the time, if you were a jerk in life, guess what? You are an awful jerk in death. In this case, this was uh, an overseer. Overseer was the person who um, uh, supervised the slaves. And this man liked his job an awful lot, too much. He was just a horrible, horrible man. Um, and they have uh, had someone come in and bind him to this little caretaker's cottage because he was roaming the grounds. And, and it's a wedding venue. And they said, we can't have him. But I even have a picture of him literally his face looking like a goat's head. Okay, so he's such a horrible person that he wants you to be afraid. So he appeared, and I do have that picture of um, a goat's head, and it was right behind a, a woman. It was a public event, and she felt something behind her, and we snapped a picture, and there was this thing. He's a horrible person. So a lot of the really, you know, stuff that people say is negative and evil and whatever, they're just people. They're awful people, but they're people. Spirit. Uh, one last question. <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, when you call a spirit, when you call spirit, how long does it usually take for them to answer? I'm not sure if I understand that question, um, because not all uh, respond. I mean, basically, I mean, we, I talked about it last time. I mean, if someone you know passed over, crossed over, um, you may not be able to connect with them for a year. Or I, their question is, is when you're doing a uh, a uh, investigation, right? how long does it take for, if you call out like Bernadette or George, how long has it usually take for them to answer back? Um, it varies. We try to leave, you know, as much time as we can. And we're talking seconds in between that and the next um, question. 
Uh, depends on the device we're using. Some of them, uh, like the Spirit Box, has a cycle that it goes through because it's frequencies, radio frequencies, so it has a cycle. So we kind of we have to wait till the next cycle comes for them to answer us because they use the uh, radio frequency to actually form words. So it depends on the device, but usually it's I just leave in 10, 15 seconds. In fact, I, you know, answered too soon and, and talked over them. It also depends on how much energy they have. They can be much quicker if they have a lot of energy, um, which they can draw from, sometimes they draw from the equipment, sometimes from the, the house that they're in or the building that they're in. It, it depends on those kinds of things. But we only leave, you know, five to 10 seconds at the most before we move on unless we're waiting for a cycle. And that are all, that's all our questions this evening. Dr. Carroll, thank you so much. Thank and you. Everyone, thank you for participating this evening and asking really great questions. And I hope you can join us next week when we're at the Marvel Museum, also here in Georgetown, Delaware. We will be doing that as a Facebook Live only event via the Camp Rehoboth's Facebook page. And that will be next Tuesday at 7 p.m., so another on location with Dr. Carroll, our haunted history. Thank you so much. And thank you out there for um, participating this evening. And feel free to, um, to check out the Brick Hotel, come by for a meal, and you just may never know who you bump into. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. Thank you.